As a senior at the Naval Academy, early in my senior year, I competed for uh, the opportunity to become a, a Navy SEAL uh, from, uh, upon commissioning. Uh, three days later, I was in a serious automobile accident. I was in intensive care at Bethesda Naval Hospital for several days. And the day that I came out of intensive care, I'd only been out actually a few minutes. Uh, when the nurse on the ward said, I hear you want to be a Navy SEAL, do you want to meet one? And I said, of course. Uh, she wheeled in, uh, in a wheelchair, a severely wounded uh, Navy officer uh, named Tommy Norris, uh, who had been shot 35 days earlier in Vietnam with a, a bullet that penetrated his jaw and came out his forehead and, and essentially took away half of his face. We had a good talk. Uh, but at the end, I asked him if he could change anything, what would it be? And he said, I only want to continue serving as a Navy SEAL, but I'll be medically retired as a result of my injury. And I thought, if this guy has been through all that, uh, and he still only wants to continue to serve as a Navy SEAL, that's good enough for me. And it was a huge inspiration. It turned out that that Tommy Norris was later awarded the Medal of Honor uh, for an operation that he had conducted six months before he was shot, and he was the subject of another Medal of Honor in that when he was shot, uh, the man who rescued him, uh, Petty Officer Mike Thornton, later was himself awarded the Medal of Honor. So uh, here I was at this nexus of, of SEAL history, unknowing, uh, but inspired uh, by Tommy Norris in a way that, uh, that helped me overcome my injuries and get through SEAL training. I grew up near Puget Sound and developed an affinity for the water early, but the water in Puget Sound is cold. And, uh, and I knew that if I wanted to scuba dive, I had to have a wetsuit. Uh, so when I was in my early teens, uh, I had a newspaper out, uh, but it wasn't enough money to buy a wetsuit. Uh, so what I did with that money was buy two gunny sacks of wetsuit scraps uh, from a local manufacturer eight cans of wetsuit glue and I laid down on a big table and my mother took a pencil and drew around my body uh, on a piece of uh, butcher paper. We moved the lines out, I glued the pieces together to make a front and a back, I glued them together, cut down the middle for a zipper and uh, wore that wetsuit for five years. I think the lesson of that of course is that um, you can find a way. The United States Special Operations Command uh, was formed after the failure uh, to rescue hostages, American hostages that were held in Tehran, Iran in 1980. It was a glaring hole in our national military capability. Until that point, our special operations forces, uh, Army Green Berets, Rangers, Navy SEALs, Air Force combat controllers, specialized aviation, uh, both fixed wing and rotary wing, and the like, uh, were under each of the services. But in the big scheme of things, competing with aircraft carriers and submarines and tanks and uh, satellites, they didn't score the same priority. And so they were not organized as a coherent force, and they were not trained and equipped at the highest levels. Congress created the United States Special Operations Command and assigned it a budget 25 years ago, almost 25 years ago. Uh, and that allowed this group to come together, to habitually train together, to develop joint tactics and techniques, uh, to become a widely capable uh, force that then served its commanders quite well. I think in terms of the um, raid during which Osama bin Laden was killed, there are a few things that we can say, a few things that are worth understanding. Uh, one is that looking up and out. Uh, this was a national level effort that brought together other agencies of government in a very powerful way, particularly the intelligence community and the special operations community uh, came together to plan, rehearse, and conduct this um, in, a, in a way that perhaps would have been undoable uh, just a few years prior. Uh, but the, the fact that this was a gelled operation, a gelled plan, uh, was a real confidence builder for the, the senior decision makers who had to accept the risk of, of approving this operation. And then looking in and down, I think the joint nature of the special operations community, now looking back 25 years uh, with, as I said, habitual training, 
um, compatible equipment, deconflicted uh, tactics was very, very important to bringing a level of this, uh, an operation of this level uh, together. Third, I think that, uh, that the wisdom of creating a special operations community or in any context, uh, a specialized force within a force to take on the most difficult problems uh, for which people really can focus their intellect, focus their, uh, their research, focus their equipment development and the like. Um, the highlights of it, I think the, the creation of Special Operations Command I think highlights the value of, of that approach. Uh, the Bin Laden raid, fourth, the Bin Laden raid was not routine by any means, but that kind of operation, meaning operators getting in a helicopter, flying some distance, conducting some sort of operation on a specific target, and then flying home has been conducted thousands of times in the last few years. Uh, the strategic nature of this target made it far more important that it be rehearsed uh, very carefully, that it be planned very carefully, that it be briefed uh, with a higher level of fidelity than certain other plans uh, in order to build the capability in the force and the level of confidence uh, to approve the operation. Uh, but that was, a, that was a very key factor in, uh, in the success of that. And then fifth, it was successful because nobody talked about it uh, before. And one of the lessons that we've taken away is that if we want to be able to continue this kind of capability to have this uh, kind of force, then we can't talk too much about it uh, now either. So I think it's a real tribute to the force of the specific equipment, the specific tactics, the specific people uh, who conducted that raid have not yet been made public. I think the photograph that depicts the world at night. Uh, you've all seen it. It's the satellite photography made as a composite that shows where the lights are and where the lights aren't uh, as, as night, you know, as, as regions are in the dark. Um, our, our Cold War mentality, our pre-911 thinking was clearly that the strategically important areas on Earth are where the lights are. That's where people live, goods are made, money's uh, um, transferred. Um, our friends and our enemies were generally in this relatively narrow band of the mid-northern hemisphere uh, where the lights were on. And then on 911, we were caught by surprise uh, to a large degree in having to deal with the world, the rest of the world where the lights aren't, uh, where open areas are ungoverned or undergoverned, where training camps can um, can be established, where borders are more porous and smuggling occurs, where societal conditions uh, contribute to recruiting of, of people for criminal or terrorist uh, purposes, where airports are less secure and force can be projected through them. As we look back over the last few years at where the specific threats against the United States came from, uh, they're traceable mostly back to where the lights aren't. And we found uh, we found ourselves generally less prepared to operate in those areas, to deal with those areas. The politics, the markets, the military forces, um, all aspects of those societies. Uh, then we were to deal with, uh, with the places where the lights are. Uh, so we're struggling to catch up. But I think it's, uh, it, it's very important to consider the, the demographics, the resources, the politics, the religions, the tribal clannish nature of certain uh, places, where, places where the lights are not uh, as we look forward to assess our strategic challenges. It's a human vision, legacy we want to leave behind us.